Welcome back to On The Table Gaming, and this week we're talking about Visions in the Flames, Episode 7, and as always, I'm joined by game designer Michael Chanel and lead game developer Fabio Curry. Guys, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Once again, Chase, you know the, you know the drill. It's great is to be it, here. Is it a little bit like Groundhog's Day? Is it uh, it's just like this guy again? It's like, oh, uh, we're in 2021 <laughs> here, right? Eh? Oh, great. Feels like 2020 a little bit. It's the same old, same old here. Well, but you guys, it's not same old, basically. You guys came in here with uh, another article and really opened up our understanding of where things are going once again for a Song of Ice and Fire the Miniatures game. So in this latest article penned by you, Fabio, well done. Thank you. You talk about how you're reevaluating the points cost on on every attachment, and you give us some examples, especially with the idea of character attachments now being costed. You're you're saying around one to two points with a few three-point exceptions, maybe? You know, what's what's the thought process behind these changes, and, and how do you see your revamping of character attachments in general? How do you see those changes enhancing the game at large? So um, we were noticing that attachments usually weren't bringing in their weight um, when, in regards to point costs. Um, instead of keeping them at really high costs in general, we decided to lower these um, these point costs to maintain the effects, and now we we believe that they're in par. Um, this is in regards to all attachments, but character attachments specifically need a special look into them because of just how they interact with the books and, and how that can raise challenges to when we're adding them to the faction. Because some characters, like even Gregor Clegane, right? How do you represent Gregor Clegane in an army? Um, he's supposed to be this big, huge, angry guy, right? And he can cut a horse in half. I, I'm, I'm rambling now, but <laughs> what I mean is um, that's not really the Lannister playstyle, but Gregor is a Lannister piece. So how can we make that fit in where it seems uh, natural and it plays naturally into the, the faction? That's the hardest part, I would say. Well, it was really cool seeing the the four you gave as examples. You know, I think so far, it seems like you've really been getting to, keeping to the theme and you know, I'm excited to kind of get into those. But how do you see, um, you know, maybe... What's your philosophy behind, you know, it's really hard to balance these for sure, but how do you see character attachments maybe representing something other than what you can get in your, you know, regular run of the run of the mill attachments? So when it comes to characters, it's almost kind of a a reverse design philosophy. With generic attachments, you take something that as a theme for the faction or a mechanic that you want to see implemented and you can build an attachment based around that. With characters, you kind of have to start from a separate point where you have to go, this is the character, what do they represent, and then work that into the faction. Like, let's take a look at Lannisters for an example. If we're going to make something like a guard captain or an assault veteran or a champion of the faith, we can design those, you know, to fit the needs of what we need mechanically or some theme in the faction that we want to explore. But when it comes to characters, we can't, you know, we have to start from the identity of that character. So we have, like, Gregor Clegane. Uh, he is a big rampaging monster, which kind of is the antithesis of a lot of what the Lannisters have. So you, you, know, you can't just give him a set of abilities that mechanically fit if they don't thematically fit in with him. So for like his uh, example, he becomes a subset of, okay, I want to play Lannisters, which are based around control, manipulation, and things like that. But my commander that I'm choosing to take is this big rampaging combat monster. Technically, the mechanics, like skill set of abilities that you have, that would be better suited in another more aggressive faction. But you don't have that option because it's Gregor. You know, he's in Lannisters. Like, that's just kind of a centralized theme. Like, it doesn't make sense if he was in Starks. It didn't make sense if he was in Greyjoys. He is a Lannister. And not including an iconic character like that, that's just not something you can do. So therefore... <laughs> You'd be like, nope, sorry, guys. Lancers, you don't get to play these guys because they were too hard to make. <laughs> right. So you you know, you know, have to work around, how do I keep true to what makes this character this character, but also makes it so he meshes with the faction in a way that you know is rewarding and enjoyable to play? Examples you gave, I think, really keep the the flavor a lot. And you know, maybe starting with even uh, Jojen Reed here the, with uh, Greensight. We see uh, a pretty big transformation here, right? I mean, Jojen Reed really before was kind of the disciple of the RNG gods. And now we have his abilities going actually to the point of being an innate ability. 
Uh, and so each time he performs an attack or charge action, he can gain one of the following abilities, can reroll dice, he can reroll his charge distance and ignore hindering and rough terrain keywords. I mean, that's really great. And it's, and it's baked in. So it seems like there maybe is this a kind of hinting at the idea of a general shift away from some of the more random elements in this uh, 2021 update? Could you maybe speak behind that or the thought process behind that? Um, well, randomness is not only unavoidable, but part of what makes a war game fun. So um, we're not running away from randomness, right? But but on these more specific cases like Jojen, I guess that the random element, although it, it was interesting as a design space, it was not really being perceived as something fun by the players um, because it wasn't as reliable as it should be. When you're paying points for something, you should usually know what, what's going to happen. Well, so in this case, it's also a matter of your points investment. If you have a random effect that can happen majority of the time on like a one point attachment, that's different than having something I'm investing two or potentially even three points into that sometimes is not going to do what I want. That basically comes down to, okay, am I going to have this unreliable two point investment here that is potentially very powerful, but also potentially doesn't do anything to me? or two lesser one-point investments here. So that's where it comes down into averaging your, your cost versus effect. And that's actually kind of the overarching topic of you know, the article that we put out this week uh, in, in those regards. You know, what, does, what should one point buy you in the game? What should two points buy you in the game? Three points and upwards. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, interesting. So um, now I'm kind of going through my head and trying to theory craft what, what other units might look like here. But let's stick on the ones that we do know here that you've spoiled. So uh, Jamie Lannister. Okay, so first off, I know Duncan Rhodes, he was a big fan of running the old Jamie, and he, and he ran a lot of those in his early Lannister games, so I'm sure he'll be excited to see this updated attachment. But what I'm wondering, uh, two things, is number one, um, you know, Jamie Lannister has been in the game for a while. Do you remember, like, how early was the Young Lion originally designed in this game's life cycle? Was it, like, this is one of the earlier attachments that was made? And, you know, how does the 2021 version maybe capture, like, the thematic feel of this character? Jamie was actually the second character uh, sketch drawn up when we were initially pitching the game and the concepts to George R. R. Martin. That's Whoa, how long okay. ago it was. <laughs> oh, my. In fact, and that's well, how many years ago is that then? Because pitching, that's got to be. Listen, Wave Chase, I, I, I don't know. Last <laughs> year was a good decade. So I, <laughs> anything before that is just the, the great long ago and the before times. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, you know, so flavor wise, we see this change here. He's got stalwart. He's got now martial training in which he can reroll attack dice and the defender becomes vulnerable. You know, how are you kind of, how do you guys feel like you're capturing the identity of Jamie Lannister and like the feel of the characters in, in this sort of particular attachment? So um, Jamie is actually one of the Lannister's people with the most martial training. So not only does that fit in that sense, but we really wanted to represent that if Jamie's there, everyone knows he's there, not only his opponent, but obviously his own units and they want to perform better they want to draw his attention so we do believe that um, the combination of martial training with stalwart represents jamie these abilities individually might not but them together really um, bring him up as his own character so one of the uh the things that when it comes to jamie lannister that is kind of glossed over in some of the source material like when people are remembering it is that you have the the public perception of Jamie, and then you have Jamie as a character. We spend a lot of time with him personally as a character, so we see his true faces and everything. But it is talked about many times that when Jamie is like in a battlefield camp or sometime, you know, moving you know Lannister forces around, they are inspired by him because he still has that reputation as the greatest duelist and one of the greatest swordsmen to ever live in the Seven Kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So he is this. You know, we know who he is actually as a person, but there is still the legend that surrounds, you know, the the young lion. And this is the version that represents that, the one that is, you know, boosting the morale of the men that he's around. They're like, you know, oh, man, we have the golden lion here. We've got Jamie Lannister with us. We can't possibly lose. And, you know, we know Jamie is a person. He's very flawed. He is, you know, he does somewhat care about the people around him, but he's also willing to just do what he can to save himself. But no one really, you know, knows a lot about that. So when we have the different versions of Jamie, we have his commander version, which even with the new updates that we did, we'll, I guess, get into this in the coming time. 
you know, he is basically the star of the battlefield. You know, he is the the center, you know, the ringmaster, and that's how his commander version plays, where it's all about Jamie all the time, making his unit the best it possibly can, and making sure he is the just absolute shining beacon on the battlefield. Then you have the Kingslayer, uh, that that sorry, and that's his Kingslayer one, which is more like kind of infamous version of him. You have his Kingsguard version, which is representing the fact that he is, you know, one of the best duelists out there in the Seven Kingdoms. So it's really pushing that aspect of him. And then you have the Young Lion, which again represents that kind of living legend to uh, the Lannister forces. Like, you know, oh, this is a battalion here led by Jamie Lannister. You know, so yes, we're going to be more inspiring. And yes, he does have, you know, the martial training capabilities, not necessarily in leading men, but inspiring them and just being there. You know, he does have like proper like night training and everything, which is more than the common guardsman or something. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I think that's what's so cool about seeing these is that, you know, I felt like he really did capture the feel of Jamie Lannister in the original version. But in this one, you know, moving beyond the kind of inspiring it through like bolstering ranks, in this case, having stalwart, having the martial training for the young line, like it seems like you managed to capture it again in, in a whole new different way or not a whole new different way, but in another way that maybe actually even feels like more authentic to the theme of the character. And I think with all these attachments, that really kind of rings true. Moving on to Corn Halfhand here, I mean, wow, like he's looking sharp. So, you know, his order to the last is pretty fantastic. In this case, when, they, when the unit's destroyed that he's in, the unit makes a morale test. And on a success, it's not destroyed, but it remains in play with one wound and then becomes panicked and vulnerable. Uh, you know, and as you point in the article, like with Night's Watch isn't necessarily you know, lacking for morale, like it's not bad, average stat around five. Um, this is going to be a, a pretty cool ability. And additionally, you've got go down fighting still. Uh, but here we see that go down fighting, it doesn't have the kicker anymore. It doesn't have the, if, if you control the attack zone on the tactics board, do D3 wounds. Does that kind of, the, the, the dropping of the D3, that's sort of kind of in line with your overall philosophy of the 2021 update as well, right? Or, or moving away from some of the D3 effects, and it seems to be more like rank-based or more static-based. Yeah, definitely. You can expect Go Down Fighting to be in Corrin's version across the board where it was placed. And, well, I guess in this case, we felt that the effect itself was already good enough. Um, the fact that it deals wounds is supposed to be very special in a way. And we felt that we didn't need that kicker effect to increase the damage output because it is already reliable and consistent. In regards to, to the last, I guess you can actually fit Corrin basically anywhere in a Night's Watch list because of their very good morale values. So it's not always going to work, but it's consistent. It's pretty consistent. Right, you could kind of bet on it. Like, you know, there's ways to set it up to make it not work, too, for your opponent. There's a little bit of counterplay. And, uh, you know, we got to speed through these things to get to the, uh, as always, the really important stuff there, which is the Weeper, Cruel Tyrant, with a Free Folk. And, um, you know, he saw his orders replaced. So he dropped both his orders, and instead now he has one order, Grizzly Example. And this allows him to inflict a wound on his own unit to make all enemies at short range panicked, which is really cool. And it kind of lost the kind of bolstering his own troops or keeping them from running away through being fierce, but instead now really leaning to that offense component. And in addition, he gains vicious on his base. So in, in a faction with a lot of attachments, it must be a really interesting challenge to make characters that like really stand out. Uh, I love how here, like kind of making it the centerpiece, kind of like how you talked about Jamie Lannister being kind of a centerpiece unit. Uh, the Weeper as an attachment here really does have that feel in that it has like, you know, a kind of an aura effect. Um, was it challenging, like trying to kind of re-envision or, or to make tweaks to characters that are attachments in, in this new update? I'd say for the free folk, uh, more so than any other faction. And let's talk about the Weeper specifically in this case. Well, we kind of felt that although he was playing on morale and panic, um, why was he actually helping his own units um, pass panic tests, right? He <laughs> didn't yeah. really feel something that the Weeper would do. So we, I wouldn't say he was re-envisioned, but we just pegged him into his place. Well, he he can't he uplift be. his allies? You know, just because he's a bad guy doesn't mean he's a bad guy. He, he <laughs> and I think... Um, with these free folk chiefs, like some of them, like um, 
Steyr is the Magnar, but they have mm-hmm. different titles. But these, I'm just going to call them generically Chiefs, although that is wrong canon. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll cut you some <laughs> slack here. Yeah. They'll all of them want to push their own play style, and that's kind of the free folk way, you know, especially with uh, attachments and character attachments where they all came from a different place, they have a different strategy, and free folk are supposed to have this wide array of tools that don't necessarily don't necessarily synergize with each other. And that's sort of what the Reaper does. He is pushing that panic um, f- mechanism in your army to a really high level, but only where he is. And that's not necessarily going to synergize with the other commanders. Right. But once you put them all together, you're going to break through your enemy one way or another. You'll eventually have the right tool. That's awesome. And it looks like it's going to be really cool to maybe see even trigger off of like with things like coordination tactics, where it also has that clause that you can trigger like a start of the turn order. At the same time, like this is a cool attachment because, you know, uh, it, it, you could, you know, trigger on his turn and charge and with your vicious. But it seems like it's also going to be a situation where uh, maybe you're going to be outside of charge range and you can't do that. And that is actually going to be something you can use once your troops are already engaged. And, you know, you're not getting those bonuses necessarily from, you know, the charge rerolls. And you're, you're getting bogged down. And it seems like he can give you a nice little burst there to get a bunch of enemies panicked. So that even when you're hitting them, you have a chance of, of pushing through some damage. I don't know. It seems really cool. And I like the way it's just it's such a flavorful character. So I'm excited to see, like, how he fits in with the context or doesn't fit in with the context of, like, the other characters or other attachments. Was it interesting? Was it, was, was it challenging at all, like, picking what character attachments you wanted to show? Like, how did you come to these four? Uh, so honestly, on this case, we just went like, well, we don't want to show too many here because we, you know, you don't want articles to go like super long. We have, you know, seven factions here to show through and everything. So we just like, well, we'll just pick the first four. So, you know, Lannister, Stark, Night's Watch, and Free Folk. And that's one we went with, you know, because uh, we wanted to li- limit this to characters. And we already showed a couple of characters when we showed the neutrals before. So, you know, it's like, well, they already got to show something special there. So we'll just go here and, you know, pick these next time. You know, it might be some other factions that we showcase and everything. On top of that, we also wanted to show attachments from from these factions, obviously, that in, helped people understand what we were envisioning and what what changes to be expect, expected. Uh, a final point there as well is that we wanted to showcase in this one some of the ones that um went through uh, i'd say some of the more like a uh, larger scale changes because there are some attachments that like they received very minor tweaks if any maybe an ability name change or in some cases no change at all and so you know it wouldn't be really cool if we went like hey here's some examples of you know things that you can expect in 2021 nothing nothing <laughs> different here at all there you go so you know we did choose some of the ones that like either received an overhaul or some you know basically major changes i would say versus just ones who had some smaller numbers tweaks or whether they stayed the entirely the same or an ability name changed and that was the significance uh you know so kind of maybe trying to to mine a little bit of stuff here um it seems like so with go down fighting we see an example of a that kind of kicker ability being not there the 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 uh, tactics board component um is that something we might see more of and is there um any explanation or philosophy behind why on some of the maybe generic abilities we don't see them have any interplay with the tactics boards on these examples so i this is actually a very case-by-case scenario we didn't see the need for that on go down fighting but other abilities and tactics cards will still maintain their kicker effects some abilities gained kicker effects um it once again it's really hard to give just one answer here okay so it's not like a sweeping change it's a hey for this one ability go down fighting we realized it didn't need it exactly exactly yeah usually if something was like cut out it's because it just wasn't needed or it was creating just a improper scaling compared we wanted to see like in the case of go down fighting you know it you're having a very consistent effect here in dealing one damage per destroyed rank and then you had this little boosted effect That was, okay, instead, now it's going to be D3 if these other conditions are met. So when we're evaluating the point costs and through that, we have to see, like, okay, does this effect, like, what is this effect valued at? What is it bringing to the faction? Is this part of the effect something that's really needed? 
And in our, like in this specific situation, you know, one of our efforts was to lower the amount of just uh, automatic wounds they go through and whatnot. And so this just naturally went to the chopping block as something that wasn't needed. Also, it ties in with the concepts of just lower damage output overall that we've spoken about previously. So again, it's a case by case thing, you know, and some actual effects gained additional interactions with tactic slots, similar to like what you see with the King's Guard. Um, or actually, I guess in this situation here, where you know, if you meet a certain condition, usually controlling a tactic zone, you'll gain some additional bonus effect. Those actually have been increased very slightly across um, some effects through the game. But again, like Fabio said, it's a case by case thing. A lot of them were removed, some of them were tweaked, some of them were moved sideways. Okay. People have been really excited about these updates. You guys have been doing a great job uh, communicating, putting out these weekly articles. It's been absolutely fantastic. I know we're still a little bit of ways away from the release of the update, right? You guys were saying quarter two. Is there a plan to continue on with this sort of formatting uh, until then? Or if not, Visions, will there be continued updates or information coming out about the game up until the release? Yeah, definitely. We do plan on keeping communications very open and uh, steady, let's say. But of course, there is a limit that we can show until eventually we've shown everything (laughs) and discussed everything. So um, probably uh, don't expect any large swooping changes articles because most of everything has been covered right now. We'll take the time to pick our favorites and talk about some more specific aspects. And yeah, and that's it. Hey, I have an idea here. And uh, let's go off script here for a second. Not that we actually have a script here, come to think of it, but let's go even further off the rails here. So uh, one of the articles that we were going to be posting up at some point was, since we've looked at the character attachments, we are going to have a bit more of a focus on the commanders. Um, You know, specifically when we talked about before about the play styles they bring and one of the efforts of really focusing them in as you know this is their role in the army this is why you're going to play them and really you know honing in on what makes each personality cool so that was going to be the topic of one of our articles and of course in those articles we show examples here and whatnot so let's go ahead and reverse this and put chase on the spot here and go chase uh i know you can technically edit the same time but we're going to hold you to a very strict timer here Uh, okay you get to name one commander here and that's the one that we will thomas and both free folk is that so there we go. <laughs> is that there how that we works? Go. I know people uh, are going to be pissed, yeah. but but <laughs> to all you wonderful on the table listeners out there, Chase, in his infinite you know wisdom and just absolute enthusiasm, has thrown out <laughs> Tormund Giant's Bane out of every single potential oh, commander no, option this is be a in the entire groan. game. Oh no! Oh like, no! What have I done? Daenerys, man. You oh, could have no! picked Daenerys, man. You could have picked Daenerys. You could have picked the Kingslayer, but oh, you picked Tormund Giant's Bane. So, <laughs> oh no, oh, I have so, made a huge mistake. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> listeners. Oh God. <laughs> so, I guess join us for you know our upcoming article that we'll have out in the you know the the upcoming oh, time. No, are you serious? Featuring oh, commanders no. and a specific spotlight on Tormund Giant's Bane of the Free Folk. Oh man, I definitely made a mistake. But hey, Chase, until then, we hope you get your miniatures oh, no. on the table. <laughs>